Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Foreman community demo. Uh, today, I'm filling in for Melanie, and unfortunately, that means we are not live today. But for those of you watching later, you can ask us questions on RSC on Twitter or on the comments for the video that will be uploaded to Twitter. Start with a few announcements. So Foreman 2.3 has been released. And we're looking forward to 231 and to 222 very soon. So look out for that. Catello has had a lot of releases in this time. So 317.1 and 316.2 are out. Uh, 3.18 RC2 is available for testing now. And one more announcement from Shira. So Shira to you. Thank you, Ori. I have a quick announcement on Overt Compute Resource. So Overt REST API v3 was deprecated in Overt 4.0 and it's no longer supported from version 4.3. And uh, therefore we deprecated API v3 in Foreman 2.3 and we will drop it, drop it completely in Foreman 2.4. So if you have any old Overt Compute Resource that is still using API v3, you should definitely move it uh, to work with the API v4 as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shira. As I said, the announcement were, was, were short because we have a lot of content today. So let's move to our demo. Uh, we'll start with Samir, uh, has two uh, demos today uh, with about Catello, the capsule sync optimization, and after that, Pulp 3 uh, tag container manifests. Samir, over to you. Uh, thanks, Ari. Uh, good morning. I'll, uh, I'll just try to present my whole screen. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. OK, all right. So uh, my first presentation today is about some performance improvement changes that we have made around capsule syncing. So some background to this is, uh, so earlier when we used to sync a capsule, so for example, I have this uh, proxy here in my environment. So yeah, we have two options to synchronize the capsule. The first one is optimized and the other one is a complete sync. So complete sync would uh, synchronize all repositories uh, to the capsule regardless of whether it needed to be or not and optimized sync was smart in pulp so uh Ketelo would send a request to pulp to synchronize a particular repository to the capsule and then pulp would decide if the repository actually had changed between the current sync and the previous sync so what used to happen is Ketelo used to send a request to Pulp regardless of whether the repository needed to be synced or not, since we did not have uh, any history of which repositories were synced on which capsules. So what we are introducing with this change is now Ketelo maintains a history for uh, smart proxy repositories, so the which looks something like this. So we maintain the state of the smart proxy reposit, uh, smart proxy and the repository that it was synced to, along with the start time and the finish time for that. So what happens with this is the next time you run an optimized sync, and if there's a history record tied to that smart proxy and the repository that we need to sync, Ketelo skips over that repository and does not actually send a request to Pulp to sync that record. So uh, let me do a quick demo. So, and what complete sync does in this case is delete all of these smart proxy sync history records tied to this uh, particular smart proxy. And that causes all of the repositories to get synced again. So I'll run a quick demo. So if you see, I have two repositories and two smart proxy sync history records with IDs five and seven. So I'll go ahead and run a complete sync on this. That should delete both of these smart proxy sync history records first. 
Yeah. So if you see, uh, I have two new smart proxy sync history records, and it shows finished at nil for the second one because I ran it in between. Now that the sync is over, we should have the finished at date for both of these history records. And if I go look at the task for this sync history record, Yeah, so this is the task that got executed. So if you see there are tasks to sync the capsule for uh, in form of request to pulp for two repositories here. And now if we go back uh, to the smart proxy. So this was the complete sync. Now if we try and optimize sync, it will skip over both of those repositories in the next sync. Okay. Yeah. So this is the optimized sync, and the run phase will skip over all the calls to pulp to actually synchronize the uh, repository on that. And the smart proxy sync history record will remain unchanged because we didn't actually perform any syncs. So this was the smart proxy sync optimization demo. I'll move on to the uh, tagging of manifest for Docker repositories. All right. So here I have a test Docker repository, and we have to manifest for this repository and a container image tag. So earlier with pulp2, uh, we had a feature in Hammer to actually create custom tags by tagging any of these manifests. And we are introducing the same feature to pulp3 for feature parity. So to do that, the uh, Hammer command looks something like this. So you provide the ID of the repository that you need to tag the manifest in. This one is ID 3. So I'll change this command. So we provide the repository ID. Uh, we provide a name, custom name, that you want to tag the manifest as. And it takes the argument for the shard digest for the manifest that you want to tag. So let's. Uh, create a tag for one of these manifests. So we'll copy over this SHA and type it in. Let this finish. Yeah, so this is the tag that we created from Hammer. So this is the thumbnail tag, and this created a tag for this particular SHA that we had offered. So this is the feature which was available in Pulp2. We are just introducing it for Pulp3 as well. And yeah, that's all of my demo. Thanks. Thanks, Samir. Uh, no live questions unless one of the pre presenters here would like to ask anything. Okay, then we'll move to Evgeny about what's new with Ansible modules. Right, hi. Um, I hope you're not bored yet to hear me talking about forming Ansible modules and especially not not having slides because I don't really like doing slides. 
Nevertheless, since the last demo I that I joined, it was like in September, we had three releases of Formula Ansible modules that came quite packed with features that I want to talk through with you today. Um, let's start into like right chronological for, uh, order. The first release back in October was 1.3 which I briefly mentioned in the last uh, demo with the environment fallback for the um, credentials. So you can now inject credentials for your form insta instance using environment variables and don't have to hard code them in your playbook. And the other, in my opinion, rather interesting feature in 1.3 was a new module called status info. So you can now do a simple request to your form and instance and fetch information about whether it's up or not and whether it itself thinks it's healthy. This is especially useful when you're doing uh, maintenance, so you can use that in uh, that module for waiting until Foreman is back up again. Moving on to 1.4, which we released in November. Um, this was, um, the, the main feature in this release was rendering our API library insights uh, collection, because we realized that having a standalone Python library that is not easily installable on every installation, like we provided RPMs, but it's not um, convenient to install an RPM in all cases, especially if you're pulling the collection from Automation Hub or Ansible Galaxy. So we now include that library inside the collection and you only need to have Python requests on your machine installed. And we think that this is something that is installed anyways. If that's not the case for you, please reach out and we'll have to think again. But Epipy was the one that's the most offending in terms of making the installation hard for users. More changes in 1.4 included uh, a change to the Red Hat Manifest uh, module, which is the only module that we have in our collection today that is talking to the Red Hat Portal API and not the Foreman API itself. It's for generating manifests that then can be installed inside Catello for accessing Red Hat content. And Red Hat um, has switched or has provided a different way to access content. It's called simple content access that you've probably seen quite a lot on Catello demos. Um, it essentially means that when you flip that switch on, you can access all of the content without providing subscriptions to individual machines. And for that, you need to switch, flip a switch also on the portal. And now the Red Hat Manifest module can do this for you. So you don't have to do it manually in the web browser. Um, we also had new modules because almost every release has new modules. Uh, and at 1.4, it was the job invocation module. So you can now both run and schedule remote execution jobs using Ansible. So in theory, you could use Ansible to schedule an Ansible job that schedules another one. So inception all the way down. Uh, and the other uh, new module in 1.4 was a smart proxy module, which can be used to for creating smart proxies in a simple um, form and installation. And for example, on Catello, where you cannot create smart proxies that easily without the installer, it still can be useful, for example, changing the download policy of a proxy, which is something that Catello users um, know and like, because you often want to have your content fully synced to the Catello machine, but only um, synced on demand to individual proxies to save space and um, make the individual things uh, smaller and quicker. And 
coming to 1.5, which we released last week. This is the latest release. And if you followed the development a bit, at least, you've seen that we were working on roles. So we don't only want to include modules that are essentially individual workflow tasks or workflow items, but we want also to map whole workflows that are useful for you as a user in roles. And the two, two new roles that we now shipped in 1.4 is number one, manifest, that is bundling the Red Hat manifest role, um, Red Hat manifest module for creating a manifest on the portal, downloads it to, to your machine, and then uploads it to Catello using the subscription mo manifest module. So you have the full, the full workflow of getting and uploading your manifest in one ROM. And the second um, role is called Content View Version Cleanup, which replaces um, CV Manager for whoever still knows this name. CV Manager was a Ruby tool that I've written in 2016, I think, for managing content views in Satellite and Catello. And it didn't get much attention in terms of maintenance since then, but it still worked. And we now have both documentation how you can transfer from being a CV manager user to from an Ansible modules, but also have a separate role for the cleanup feature of CV manager because that was not possible or not easily possible just with the modules. And this role will go, you can configure it and then it will go search on your installation for content views and remove versions that are not published to any environment and has not been used for a while. This is super handy if you want to keep your Catello installation slim and your database not stuffed with um, entries that you will never ever see again. But of course, 1.4, 1.5 did not only include this, um, it includes one very needed feature for the host module. Uh, you now are able to configure interfaces and it might sound rather not important because interfaces, or at least I, when I used for, use Foreman, I usually don't configure interfaces in the UI. But um, it's super handy if you're deploying machines on a virtual environment because using the interfaces management feature, you can actually say which VLAN um, your compute resource should attach an interface to. And um, this is now possible with the host module. And the last big uh, change or the last big change um, area that happened was in the inventory plugin. Thanks to Samir, we now support the reports API that was present in Foreman since I think 124 or so. Um, this allows us to outsource the inventory generation to Foreman. And this is much quicker than on by, by using the original API that we used. So um, if you have Foreman with Ansible plugin, you can just use that instead of, <clears throat> of, of using the, the, the host API, which is rather slow because it actually needs to go and do an API request for every single host. And the other change also in the inventory plugin was that you are now able to compose inventory host names. And the use case that we implemented this for is um, user had an essentially nonsense domain assigned to many machines and they want, didn't want to have the same domain also visible in Ansible. So they wanted to essentially just use the short, domain, uh, the short host name of machines. And now you can just apply a Jinja filter and just drop everything after the dot or 
you can use the MAC address instead of the host, uh, the, the host name to generate the inventory host name. You have any information that is available inside Foreman is also now available to construct the inventory host name, which is rather cool. And that's it. Um, 1.5 is the last release. It will be available soon also as an RPM. It's not out yet because I was lazy. And 1.6 is almost around the corner, and you'll probably see quite a nice feature then. Until next time, thank you. Thanks, Evgeny. Moving on to Lukash with the Redfish integration. All right. Um, hope you can hear me well. I'm going to hit that present button and share my Chrome. It's my secondary browser. And hope you can see it. And I'll continue. Uh, we don't see it yet. OK, it's coming up now. Thanks. Very good. So um, yeah, so this is um, a nice feature uh, that was contributed by X-Ray Sky, uh, someone nicknamed X-Ray Sky on GitHub. Um, thanks for that feature. And uh, as already said, uh, Redfish. So what, what's, what's actually Redfish? Uh, it's kind of a weird, uh, weird name. So it is, a, a, I think it's a, it's a fish, actually. Uh, that was the first, uh, it was a, a food shop, a Czech food shop. Anyway, um, Google trying to sell me. However, it is it is a, a standard design to the simple secure management uh, for of servers, basically. So it's, uh, you know, it consists of many, uh, many um, uh, vendors, thing, things like uh, IBM, HP and stuff. And basically, uh, what it does is, um, you may know the IPMI protocol, which is uh, which is another standard, which is very much older, and that, that allows you basically to do things over traditionally over serial console and then over IP or over over network, uh, do, uh, and doing things like turn a server on, turn it turn it off, or maybe set a set a boot order to boot from network. Or even things like get me to the con graphical console. These are rather, these were not very st uh, standard. However, in in this Redfish protocol, uh, things are more complex, uh, and you know it's more much more advanced. So you can do uh, m you know much more. It's kind of a to me. It looks like uh, this is kind of an IPv6 approach that yeah they're, they're trying to solve all the problems of the world uh so it's it's really complex however what's great is we have uh, the integration uh built in oh no come on um because uh, format already has a uh, bmc support in a way that if you open up a host and uh, if you open up a host and the host uh, has a, a network card which is uh, of type bmc if you enter it, uh, a IP address, and then you also need to give it credentials, uh, admin, administrator, sorry, uh, username and password. Then a new uh, BMC feature you know, appears automatically. Uh, you also need to have traditionally before the this patch, and I made another patch, you, you needed to have at least one smart proxy with BMC feature. Uh, so it's a feature that you you turn on, and uh, Foreman would you know pick the the very first smart proxy which has the feature. Now what changed before I merge X Ray Sky's PR? I changed actually that, and now you what you need to do is go to your uh, subnets. Subnets. This was previously not there, and you actually need to select. Uh, I think this one. Uh, you need to set a BMC proxy. It's not proper feature. So before before that, it was not. A, I think it was not a, the feature you could associate with a with a subnet. So you just enable the feature. So in in the smart proxies, you had actually uh, you had a, a, all you needed 
to have it was a, a smart proxy with uh, at least one smart proxy with a BMC feature, and then Foreman would pick um, you know the first uh, smart proxy, and oh that 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 one would handle the BMC communication. Now you actually need to change this and to 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 do this association, and once you have that, this. Uh, this um, smart proxy will be used for the all the operations. So here in this case, I have a one uh, smart proxy, and on that smart proxy, actually, uh, you go via our, our installer or you using you know your editor. You can you need to uh, basically review the configuration. And luckily for Redfish, actually, you don't need to <laughs> configure anything because it simply works. It's it's it, that's great. Uh, all you need to do is uh, you need to enroll your server certificate into the system um, um, operating system, uh, you know, CA store. So it's a typical update CA certificates command, I think. Uh, I don't remember the one. Uh, this one is from Red Hat Systems on Debian. It's a, it's a different command, I guess. But uh, well, once you do that, uh, that's all you need to do. Or if you're just testing this, you can turn this on, switch on. Uh, sorry, off, verify SSL, and then you'll be able to do this. And then uh, once you have that, and once your subnet has the VMC feature, uh, then th this new button appears. So uh, as you can see, this host has a VMC uh, smart proxy associated with that subnet. And second uh, second requirement is it has a VMC uh, uh, network card. Uh, in the uh, from inventory, then this button uh, shows uh, shows here, and you can start power uh, power off. Uh, you can even do I think reset and reboot and soft reboot things like you know ask the operating system to power off, or you can you know do hard reset things like that. Uh, what is actually uh, what actually uh, is available as well is you can select the boot devices. Although I was I not able to get this one working. Uh, you can actually switch boot order here. So I'm gonna click on start, and you know, are you sure? This is our workflow here, and you know, it will start the booting the system. And and I was able to get the Redfish server, which is OVC, so it's super slow. Like, so half a minute, it's loading the information. I'm not sure if that's you know, the the, the link is not that slow. Uh, maybe the protocol is or implementation there is slow. Maybe there's a, a DNS lookup. Anyway, uh, it works, and it's it, or, you know it's it's great feature. Thank thank you again, X-ray Sky for for this one. Um, and I just wanted to show you one more thing uh, here. If I do edit, um, uh, it's now blocked. Uh, this is a development setup. It's now blocked by the thread, which is uh, waiting for Smart Proxy to complete the request. Anyway, uh, I just wanted to show that you need to have a BMC NIC and you need to enter uh, username and password there. I'm, um, I hope you, you, you have seen that already, um, but it's, it's, it just appears on the NIC uh, edit page if uh, you select the BMC network card. It's always been like that, nothing is changing. And so Redfish is now actually a new provider, we call them providers. Uh, next to the IPMI and SSH provider, which is not supposed to be used for any, you know, real use. SSH provider was I implemented this only for, you know, when I want want and I, when I need to test the BMC API, form an S API. It's, it makes no sense because <laughs> SSH can indeed turn off the server, but you can't turn it on because you don't have SSH, <laughs> right? So here, uh, interfaces, edit, and you can see here, you know. Uh, username, password, and the provider. That's what I'm what, what I'm telling you. So Redfish is here. It's new. So thanks. It's a great feature, and we'll see a lot more. I think of Redfish about Redfish because it's you know a, a nice uh, standard emerging, and it's I guess it's much better than IPMI because it is basically a REST API. So something that's really comfortable to use. And the, I have a, a small one more announcement. I have released Discovery Foreman Discovery Image 3.7 minutes ago. Uh, as you can see, we skipped 3.6 because it didn't actually work. I was not able to deliver those fixes in time. But for 3.7, um, it's a major change. And it now contains Ruby from our SCL repository. 
um, and now smart proxy and all the scripts and also factor are all running running on the new Ruby and Ruby 2.0, which is this is 10 OS 7 based. It's no longer on the image, and uh, we we went through this because we wanted to upgrade from factor 0 0.2 point something uh, to factor 4. Point zero, so that, that's a huge change. Please go ahead and try the new image report box. Uh, it is it, there might be bugs, yeah, but you know it it, it it works for my simple workflow. So hopefully that's that it works for you as well. So that's all I have for today. Um, over to you, Ori. Thank you, Lukash. And it's a good opportunity to remind people that if there is a community contribution but they can't make it to the demo, we're happy to demo it for you if you let us know. And our next demo today is from Leosh about cloning operating system. OK. Let me shut the screen. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, can you see my Chrome? Everything looks good? Yep. Nice. So, yeah, as you said, I'm going to talk about cloning operating system. It's new, really tiny feature, not as big as the Redfish integration. And as the title said, it's about the cloning operating systems. So before that, when users want to create it, new operating system, let's say another minor version, for example, CentOS 7.2, they have to go to the form, fill all the forms, all the inputs again, and then save it, which is kind of you know, annoying when you are creating every single time when you have new release. So now you can just hit the clone button. All the fields are copied, including partition tables and installation media. Templates are still have to be Aside on the template side first. And yeah, that's basically it. So when you said, let's say 7.2, and you hit submit, ta -da, you don't need to fill all the forms again. And yeah, that's basically it. Back to you, Ari. Thanks. Moving on to Raul. I was going to talk about external LDAP syncing external LDAP users uh, with OpenID Connect. Thanks, Ori. So we have, oh, let me share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. OK, uh, so earlier in previous demos, we've already spoken about how to configure your OpenID provider with uh, Foreman to perform external authentication. Today, we are going to go one step further, and we are going to look at how uh, you can use your OpenID provider, which in my case, I'm using Keycloak, and how you can uh, use Keycloak to sync your LDAPs uh, to Keycloak and then use those users uh, inside Foreman to log in into Foreman. So just for clarity and so that you know I'm not cheating somehow. So I'm going to refresh this page. Uh, and you see there are no, no other users. There is just the username Rahul and there is admin. So there is some setup involved in this. And let me show you the setup quickly. This is my Keycloak uh, server. I select my realm. In which I have made, uh, in which I have registered for as a client. The next thing we need to do is add a user federation. So in this user federation, you could have a Kerberos setup or you could have your LDAP server. Uh, I have uh, right now done uh, LDAP setup, so let's look at the LDAP server that I have connected here. So uh, thing is, you need to fill all these fields, which are well documented in the documentation. You can look into them and do your uh, configurations. But you need to. What you need to do is basically check if everything is connected well and things uh, are working. Just for a little bit of clarity, I will explain few fields over here. Like for example, the user object classes. So here we have uh, the LDAP server, and if you see, there is there is a entry here in which you have object classes. So all the object classes that belong to this uh, particular user 
must if you want to sync this user to keycloak all these uh, entries must be visible on your user object classes here and the another entry that is important here is uuid ldap attributes this attribute is basically one any one of your attributes inside the uh, ldap server that is uh, common in all the entries but is unique so say for example here gid number is 1001 but here it is 102 so point being that uh, it has to be unique so once all this is done and you have tested your uh, connection with your ldap server which is successful here you need to go to your mappers and make sure about one thing and that is that all your values are read from ldap like all the values that are assigned to the user user inside ldap must uh, come to your keycloak must be registered in your keycloak so so uh, similarly uh, you go to all your uh, mappers one by one and you register them so once you are done with this uh, you can what you can do is you can synchronize all users and here if you see after synchronizing all users there are seven users that have registered from the ldap server that i have uh, created so now if you go into the user section for uh, keycloak you will see a lot of users now how do you identify that uh, that the user that is uh, seen here has come from the ldap you just uh, click on the user id and you come to know that the user federation is from ldap so this is how we identify that the user has come from ldap now if you remember in the very beginning we saw that there are no users here and we are going to try to log in uh, using this particular user so um what we are also going to do is we will perform in this demo we will perform two factor authentication uh, using the otp format totp format so for that uh, there is uh, a few steps that we need to perform we need to go to the authentication tab and here you need to check if you have your google authenticator enabled another thing that you would require to check is that this by default this configure otp uh, does not have the default action button checkbox ticked so you need to tick this checkbox and um, the other thing that you need to do is uh, by default this otp form will be optional but you make uh, but you need to make it require uh, you need to make a, a required field so th that's pretty much uh, about the configuration that needs to be done the next step you need to do is uh, you need to go to your foreman server with uh, user/ext login which is external external user login which will redirect you uh, basically to the realm that was hammer cli over here for us and here we will try to log in with this particular user since this is the first time this user has uh, tried to log in uh, you will be prompted with uh, totp um, you need to scan this from your google authenticator and i'm just doing that with my phone and we will just enter the otp okay and since i have not assigned any group to it right now so it will just log in uh, like this and since this is a, a single sign on feature uh, you will not be logged out until your session has timed out your token has expired so this is uh, pretty much it and if you tr check here now if you like refresh this page and see what users you have so you have this user which registered uh, as an external user and uh, since it's not assigned to any group you don't have any um, any permissions assigned to it right now uh, another interesting thing that uh, could be is the next time that uh, let me show it in this way so the next time when this particular user tries to log in again he will only be asked for an otp which he can enter looking at his google authenticator and he should be able to log in now 
so yeah this is pretty much it about the two factor authentication using totp uh, there is one more thing that i would uh, like to mention before uh, i end this is that i have been asked few questions very frequently over discourse about whether or not this feature can be used uh, uh, whether or not this feature can be used with other open id providers um, so yes this can be used uh, i i have been using keycloak because uh, that's the one open source uh, tool that i preferred uh, while developing this uh, feature but uh, we have followed all the oauth oauth and open id connect protocols uh, according to this we've gone according to the specs so you can use any any open id provider that you wish to with this feature to to perform this feature yeah so thank you and over to you thanks harold our next presenter today is Ian uh, with the uh, Pulp 3, 3 migration timing estimate. All right. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. OK, great. So today I'm going to be presenting um, the latest update of the pulp two to three migration stats uh, rake test that you can run to see some more info about uh, how your migration is going. So I've already run this um, this rake task here. Um, if you're curious, it's just the same um, Catello pulp three migration stats task that I talked about um, in the last demo, um, and you you'll be able to run it as well um, from form and maintain. But there's one thing that's new here. So you still have your same uh, migrated over total RPMs count, errata count, and then also repositories count. But now there is a timing estimate. So whenever you run this, um, this new stats rake task, you'll get a timing estimate that's based on your RPM content. Um, and the reason we decided to start this on YUM content was to keep it relatively simple because um, it'll get wildly complicated with many variables. And usually YUM content is the heaviest hitter um, for Catello users. Um, so let me go into just a little bit about how this, uh, how the migration timing estimate actually works. Um, so I did a few tests here to collect some information. Um, if anyone wants access to this spreadsheet, just let me know. But so there are three um, grabs of data that I collected. The first one was migration timing with number of RPMs. So pretty much what I did is I just uh, I synced repositories until it hit a certain number of RPMs and then ran the migration and then graphed it. Um, I did my best to keep the repository count low because the number of repos is one of our variables. And so I did this test with uh, on-demand repositories. I did the test again with immediate repositories because their slopes are different. Um, as you can imagine, with immediate repositories, we're dealing with actual RPMs. So it takes a bit more time. So I had to take that into account. And then I did a similar test, but instead of with number of RPMs, it was with number of repositories. And the way I did that is I synced one repository that had about 1,000 RPMs in it. And then I published that to n number of content views um, to create this graph that has the number of repositories. And then after I had my data, I just had the uh, trend lines generated here. And those ended up being my, my formulas. So um, when we calculate your migration time, we look at how many on-demand RPMs you have. At that time up, we look at how many immediate RPMs you have. At that time up, and then number of repos. Stick it all together, and then you have your migration timing estimate. One thing to note is that if you have um, I guess what I'll call a, an insignificant number of RPMs. Um, the, the graphs here um, tend to be more helpful for users who have lots of RPMs um, because the timings, if the timing is below like five minutes or so, um, we're just going to tell you, we're assuming this is going to take under five minutes. But then the timings will um, hopefully be more accurate for uh, greater amounts of content. So uh, this will be ready to be used with uh, Catello 3.18. Um, I'm 
going to be really curious to hear about uh, how people like the migration timing estimate, how accurate it was, um, and over time, we'll be hoping to improve it um, because we didn't do, we did a decent amount of testing here, but not a terrible lot because we wanted to make sure we get this out quickly um, because we know it will have to um, be changed over time. But yeah, that's it for me. Thanks a bunch. And uh, yeah, just a reminder, let me know um, how you like using that migration timing estimate. Thanks. Thank you. Moving to John about the new content view page. Thanks, Ori. Let me share my screen. OK. Uh, just a follow up. Uh, a couple demos ago, I demoed the new Catello content view page repositories tab. Um, and there was some, a question about the repository types. Um, a couple were missing. These now come directly from the server. So whatever repository types are enabled in Catello, they will show up in this dropdown, and you can filter by them. And that's it. Just a quick follow-up. Thank you for following up. Uh, moving to Andre, Puppet Extraction to Plugin Update. Hello, everyone. Um, so first of all, I would just uh, remind everyone uh, the effort we are uh, on to now, and I'm updating you about is the road to making Puppet optional, presented by uh, Tomer in March. And uh, in that effort, we are creating a Puppet ENC plugin and extracting the Puppet uh, ENC functionality into a form and plugin. And you can follow these threads on the community discor discourse. Uh, so, uh, I prepared a presentation. I will share the link to it, but uh, it's basically just about having the reference uh, to the commands that you would need in, uh, in order to test it out. But the most important part is my presentation. So, uh, Basically, the functionality is about is all wrapped up in these four uh, menu items under the Puppet configuration menu. And the host forms and host group forms where we are assigning these to, uh, to hosts and host groups. So let me first show you how the host uh, and host group forms are looking right now. I will not go through the through the uh, menu items here because they should stay the same. So uh, there is nothing is changing there. Uh, in host group, if I select the environment, I can go to Puppet Classes, select a class, and in Parameters, I have uh, Puppet Class Parameters that I can, I can edit and update. I have a host group with those parameters already. So this host group is in environment production and it has dynamic uh, MOTD parameters set to false explicitly. And the same goes for uh, creating new hosts. You can select the environment and in the tab puppet classes, I can choose environment and here puppet class parameters uh, I can update this 
And again, I have a host where I've done it already. Production. I've selected three and updated one parameter for this host. So now let me migrate to a plugin. I will do it off screen because I'm doing it in development environment, but for you it would be installing the plugin from our repositories when, once it, it will land there. Now let me just, yeah, just a reminder, please, please do backup before. Uh, we are trying hard not to lose your data, but uh, it can always happen. So now, now I've migrated to a plugin, I will spin up my server again. Yep, a second now. Yes, it's up. It'll automatically reload. And let's go again from. Um, in here, I can select the environment the same as I did before. Uh, the only change that is uh, happening in the whole effort is that we moved the um, Puppet class parameters from parameters to the same tab as the Puppet classes, so you have the parameters in the classes and config groups in the same same tab. And in here, you can see that you can do, do the same. You can update the values as, as before. Uh, and if everything went well, uh, my host should uh, still be in environment production and it should have the same values and the same same classes included. Um, the same should go for the host group, although there is one patch waiting for the host group, so uh, this is not tested yet, so well, so yeah, something is not going so well, uh, but it it should uh, do the same as as it did before. Just as uh, for hosts, uh, you have the uh, class parameters in the in the same tab as uh, classes and config groups, uh, and as for the menu items. Uh, we just renamed the menu items to Puppet ENC, and a part of that, they should all look the same. Uh, if they don't, please report a bug. So we can see our environment, and this environment now comes from the uh, Formula Puppet ENC plugin, and you can see it in the URL, that should be the only difference that uh, should be notice noticeable. Uh, we hope to release uh, release the plugin with uh, Foreman 2.4, so stay tuned. If you would like to uh, help test it, it's very appreciated. We will uh, updated in nightlies as soon as possible. 
if you have a development setup, please uh, install the plugin and report any bugs that you uh, that you find out. And the last thing I would like to mention is that uh, this plugin can be removed exactly for people who uh, who want to wants to try it out in their test environment. Uh, and then if they are not satisfied, they, they want to go back. Uh, you can do that. Uh, just a reminder, this one is even stronger uh, backup because this is uh, not uh, officially supported for any plugins. You can do it for all, most of the plugins manually, but it's not really supported to uninstalling, uninstall the plugins. So uh, this would be the command that you need to run before to uh, get your data database into uh, into a state before the plugin was installed. And then you just uninstall the plugin and everything should be back and all the data migrated from uh, the plugin structures to the form and core structures and everything should work as it did before uh, you install the plugin. So that was it from me. Uh, please share your concerns uh, on this course and uh, if you can test out the plugin and uh, report any bugs you can find. This is still not released, but it will be soon and I will update update on this course. Thanks. Thank you, Andre. Now to Camille about personal access tokens UI. Hello. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? No. Not yet. Uh, mm -mm -mm -mm. Sorry, I'll try. Uh, sorry, I have some technical problem. <laughs> Do you want us to move on to Mir and we'll get back to your demo after that? Okay. Okay. So Amir presenting the experimental host details page. Hello everyone. Just a second. Share the screen. And getting an error, you must grant permissions in order to um, screen share, by the way. Let me just... Uh, refresh. So until Amir rejoins, uh, Andre, you said you can share the screen. Camille, is that okay with you? I'm sharing the screen now. Can you see it? Oh, yeah, Amir is back. Yeah, we can see your screen. Cool. So today. Wait, wait, wait a second. Uh, uh, I now see Andre's screen. So nice let's do. Um, yeah. So Amir, please reshare. We'll do yours and then we'll move to Camille. One second. OK. 
Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Cool. OK, so today I would like to show you some progress with the experimental OS detail page. Um, so let's uh, start with um, how, how to get to that page. So first of all, you need to enable um, the lab features under the settings. And after that, after that you can go to the host uh, index page. You can pick a host. And in the actions column, you can pick the new details page. So um, last time, last time I demoed the tab extension mechanism. As you can see here, we have the subscriptions and the content as a tab extension from Catero. At the moment, these are um, an empty components. So this basically just proved the concept. Um, but today I would I would like to be focused on the uh, card extension mechanism. So as you can see here, the design is based on cards. And of course, this is an experimental feature, so the design can be changed in the future. But at the moment, you can add cards to this page um, with the slot and fill mechanism. Slot and fill basically um, allow you to extend React component and to add React content from plugin to form and core. So as you can see here, we have the recent jobs card, which arrived from um, remote execution. And this is not mocked up. This is actually a real data. And um, as you can see here, we have the three recent jobs from um, remote execution with the statuses, with the um, timestamps. Um, you can go um, to the job invocation page specifically to that host by clicking on this icon. And also, you can go to um, the job invocation page itself by clicking on the timestamp. Of course, this can be changed, um, you know, the design, but uh, this is for now. So basically, how, how to um, extend cards from plugins to this page? Basically, there is a component called card item under the templates directory from the host detail directory. You can import that card item, which brings you a template for a card. You can choose between the two. You can add your own contents, like in the recent jobs, or you can use the data-driven approach for given um, a key value pairs, like in these kind of cards. Um, that's all I have to share. I am um, um, a deep dive for how to extend this page for developers will be in the next future. So stay tuned. And um, thank you for listening. Thanks, Amir. Uh, Camille, do you want to try to share your screen again? Or should Andre share his screen? OK. I hope you can see my screen now. <laughs> Not yet. Mm. I okay, don't know so what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> so Andre, please share your screen. And uh, Camille, if, let us know if that's enough, if you need him to move to something else. And if not, we can always make it up next demo. Yeah, so come on, just navigate me. What do you want to share? I will try to keep up. Come on, can you see my screen? Oh, <laughs> right. We're now seeing Camille's screen. You can see your screen now, Camille. OK, can I, can I start? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sorry for that. Uh, so uh, I would like to show you a new uh, 
personal access tokens user interface, uh, which will be available from Foreman 2.4. Uh, let's uh, open um, user page and click on personal access tokens. Uh, as you can see, I have no tokens yet, so let's create one. Uh, I have to fill token name and optionally expires time. Let's say in two days. Okay, I can see my new token. Mm, it's uh, important to uh, copy token now because I won't be able to see it again later. Mm, now uh, let's try to uh, call Foreman IPI. Mm, user admin and our token. And for example, Um, users endpoint and it works uh, I got uh, users list uh, I can also uh, revoke uh, active token like this um, and then uh, when I try to call IP account I see uh, error uh, because token is revoked. So that's all what I have. Thank you very much. Thanks, Camille, and thank you for joining our demo. So we are already a little past our time. I have one more short announcement. Uh, virtual FOSDEM, the infra management dev room was accepted and the CFP is open until the end of the year. So if you want to go submit a uh, form and talk to virtual FOSDEM, then go ahead and do it now. This is the last demo of the year. Uh, so first of all, thank you for all the presenters. Um, it's great to have uh, this much content uh, and people available in December. Uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. Happy holidays to everyone, and I hope to see you back next year presenting again. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>